in uh, May 1940, suddenly the war broke out in Amsterdam. Uh, within five days, the country was overrun. There was pandemonium all over. My, my parents didn't know what to do, and everybody didn't know what to do. People went to the, what is called the Yotzarat, which is the, Canadian, the Dutch equivalent of Canadian Jewish Congress, and they themselves didn't know what, what, what was to be. First they said, everybody will leave, then they said, nobody will leave, then they said at the end that young men can go, and women and older people and children will be safe. So my parents decided that my father would leave, and we would follow a few days later. A few days later turned out to be six years later. By virtue of the fact that my father was in Canada, my mother was able to literally bluff her way through and to tell the Germans that, we, that my father was a, a, a Canadian citizen, which he was not. Because he was, quote unquote, a German citizen, this was literally later a, uh, the, the reason why we were able to survive by being sent to Bergen-Belsen rather than to a concentration camp like Auschwitz. You have to wear the star and you, we, were, uh, we were only, a, there was a curfew. You were only able to go outside from two to four in the afternoon. And through our friends who had Turkish papers, they were able to buy us more than the normal a quota of vegetables that we were allowed to buy. It was war, and war conditions per, uh, persisted. And it was just a matter of time before they closed in on you. Um, I venture to say that few, if any, people uh, were able to escape Holland during those years. In about, <coughs> I would say, to the towards the end of 1942, the Germans started closing in on, uh, on us and they asked, they got the Jews in um, Amsterdam to move into Easter, the eastern part of the city into a ghetto. The purpose of the ghetto was rather obvious that sooner or later they would just systematically uh, go from house to house through what is called a razzia, a raid, and just take everybody away. I was brought through friends, I was brought to a town called Hil Hilberson. And uh, when I was in, staying with this family in Hilberson, because my mother didn't want me to be picked up to be sent to the concentration camp, so one day a lady asked me, who are you, what are you? She said, I'm a nice Jewish boy. So that was the end of my stay in Hilberson, because the people didn't want to be caught harboring a, uh, a Jewish child. After I came, we came back to Amsterdam, I was placed with a family in Amsterdam. And uh, one night, I noticed, I woke up in the middle of the night, and I noticed there was commotion going on. And I, I was in my crib, and I said, what's going on? They said to me, nothing. What had happened, though, was that they, someone had um, reported them to the police that they were harboring a Jewish child. So they decided to run away and they left me there and I was in my crib and uh, the next day I woke up I was playing in my crib with whatever toys I had and um, this was in 1943 so I was not yet five I was about almost five I would say and um, eventually I started crying I guess I was I was hungry and they broke open the door and I was brought to the, to the prison because they saw I was a Jewish boy. My mother had already earlier um, decided not to wear the star. My mother was not the type of person to be pushed around. She dyed her hair 
read, and she worked with the underground. And one day she came to a place where she was either supposed to bring a package or pick up a package, I'm not sure which, and the police were waiting for her. There were always people that were reporting people to the police. And they took her in as a prisoner. Towards, I would say, October perhaps of 1943, about a month later, maybe a few weeks later, we ended up in Westerbork. One morning I told my mother, when is our time? When is my time to, uh, to die? She says, you're not allowed to say that. Why are you saying that? I said, well, I don't know. Every day someone else seems to die. So I'm just, I'm just wondering. I thought it was a, a matter of, of course, a matter of fact. You know, if so-and-so dies one day, so I guess my turn is another time. Um, my mother told me once, maybe a few times, she says, one day it's going to be beautiful. She tried to, she was always an optimist, tried to be, uh, have a spirit of optimism. So I said to her, Mama, it's nice now, you know, for someone who didn't know any better. As 1944 progressed, we got less and less food simply because the Germans were losing the war and there was less and less food to go around. I remember the, the dead people being piled, the equivalent of two stories. They just, and my mother told me I'm not allowed to look because it wasn't nice. But you know, you just saw them. You just saw the, all the mason piled up high. The way I seem to remember it, there was no brutality as such. There were watchtowers all over the camp. You didn't, you didn't escape from Bergen-Belsen. There were, there were barbed, barbed wires all around. And uh, the watchtower was manned, as far as I know, day and night. And you just didn't try to escape. But um, the, way, the, the way they just took care of you, or by, by just not, not providing enough food, and uh, because the, hy the hygienic conditions were such that people just died from typhus or from whatever it was. And it was just a matter of time before everybody would have died. Towards, I would imagine it was, must have been about March 1945, when, uh, as we found out later, the Germans were uh, losing the war very fast. They decided to ship us off, we found out later, to Theresienstadt. The way we were told later was that uh, their um, goal was when we would be brought to Theresienstadt, we would be gassed there with whoever was left there. Because the enemy, so to speak, the uh, Russians on one side and perhaps the British and Americans on the other side were advancing from the east and from the west. The train was moving very slowly. It would have to detour, stop, start again, etc. One morning we woke up and we were told we were free. The train was stopped near a town or in a town called Trobitz, T-R-O-B-I-T-Z. We didn't even know what the word, what the word free meant, at least I didn't know what it meant. The object was to bring everybody back to the country where they had come from. So here we were freed in Trebitz. We were probably people from various countries. So we were brought to a big city in eastern Germany, in the eastern part of Germany. Germany at that time wasn't subdivided yet. Leipzig. We stayed in some uh, military uh, barracks for perhaps a week or two. And from there, the people that came from Holland were sent by Red Cross train to town in, this, in the southernmost part of Holland called Maastricht. Maastricht, which is near the Belgian and German border. In Maastricht, we were quarantined for two weeks because of all the diseases that we had had. 
we couldn't go back to Amsterdam, so we had to stay there for two weeks. And after the two week period, we were brought in army trucks back to Amsterdam. This was May 1945. came to Montreal, I guess on, I guess it must have been around Monday morning, the first time in, in almost six years that the family was reunited. Can you tell me a little bit about what it was like to arrive in Canada? You probably have some memories at this point. Yeah, we were, uh, well, it was, a, it was a strange country. It was very cold during the winter. I came to school, must have been a few days before Saint Valentine's Day. And the teacher, I didn't understand any English, the teacher must have told the students to bring me, give me a valentine because there were no, there were no immigrants that came in February of 1946. So all of a sudden I came home on Valentine's Day with a whole bunch of cards. I didn't even know what they were, but I, I got the idea that everybody was trying to be very nice to me. 